Morning. Yes, that's us now. You're very welcome to Cornerstone this morning. If you're visiting with us, um, please do stick around after for some tea and coffee. So we're going to be continuing in our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And today's passage is from Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to be reading from verses 5 through to 34. So that's Matthew 6, 25 to 34. This is God's word. Therefore, I tell you, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray before John comes to speak. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that as we gather here on this, the Remembrance Sunday, Father, that we are reminded of the sacrifice that many in in previous generations made for the freedom that we enjoy today. And Lord, let it point, as John prayed, to the ultimate sacrifice that Christ made in our place so that we would be set free from sin. Lord, just as you set the Israelites free in Egypt to serve you, I pray that the freedom that we as your believers walk in God, that we would use (coughs) to serve you and serve others. And we just pray for the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. And just as we prayed last week, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we just pray for so many innocent lives, Father, just at the hands of such evil. That God, ultimately, that the hope of your gospel would shine once more in this region, Lord. Father, that the name of Jesus would be lifted high in hearts in the Middle East and that you would redeem a people for yourself once more. Lord, we thank you for this passage today, Father, and the ultimate reminder that you are our provider and sustainer and that when we, as your children, trust that, God, you have our every need, Lord, we can be open-handed with what we have and generous. And Lord, I just pray ahead of the launch of Link 55 um, on Wednesday. God, I thank you for those in our church who are willing and able um, to serve and organize this. And Father, I just pray by your Holy Spirit that you would just draw people from our town. That God, that this would be a time, a weekly time where relationships would be built. God, that your goodness and your generosity would shine through it. And Father, we pray too for the up and coming outreach events. And Lord, we just ask that in all of these things that your name would be glorified. We pray for those who are organizing it and those who are on the creative element of it too. That God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would enable them, Lord, to produce something that really shines your worship. And Father, we just thank you for the youth and the weekend that they've had. Lord, thank you for the leaders that were there too. And we just pray, Lord, that each and every person there had a real tangible experience of of you, God. Lord, that everybody would be able to grow in their knowledge of you, Father, and maybe some have encountered Jesus for the very first time. So, Lord, we just pray your Holy Spirit on this place afresh once more. 
God, we pray in our kids' spaces in here today, God, that your spirit would come and that you would save. Just be with John now, anoint him with your spirit and give him your words. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Steph. Uh, this morning we are in Matthew 6 again in our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And today I say this phrase almost every week that I am preaching to myself and you just get to listen in. Uh, there is no more relevant passage to this statement today. As someone, and I need to preface this today before I even get near the passage, as, as someone who struggles with uh, anxiety and depression, I, I am literally preaching to myself today, uh, and you get to listen in. Worry and anxiety are some of the most common ailments that we face as human beings. Most of us... Uh, would admit at times that there, there, there are things that we worry about or one thing or another that, we, that would stress us. And maybe you'd admit that even today as you come into this room, uh, you are worried about something, stressed about something, anxious about something. And whilst I don't want to sanctify anxiety or over-spiritualize anxiety this morning, and I want to be extremely clear this morning, in saying this, anxiety in and of itself is not a sin. Anxiety in and of itself is not a sin, but anxiety can lead to sin. Anxiety in and of itself is not a sin, but anxiety can lead to sin, can cause us to sin. And when the Bible calls us, when Jesus calls us here not to be anxious, it is communicating the necessity of stopping an action that is already going on. If Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have had to say, do not be anxious, if he didn't realize, what? That we were going to be anxious. Jesus knows that we're going to be anxious, but it's what we do in our anxiety that matters. He knows we're going to be anxious, but it's what we are do with our anxiety that matters. The, the force of the Greek here in the original text is this. Stop perpetually worrying. Stop perpetually worrying. The ongoing attitude of worry. Jesus is going to say, stop. Stop. Stop perpetually worrying about even one thing. You see, the reality is, and this is where anxiety does become sinful. If we continually, perpetually worry about something, we are falling into the, the category of not trusting God with that thing. And that is sin. And that is sin. What we do in our anxious moments can either lead us to a God-honoring response of faith or it can lead us to acts of disbelieving sin, unbelieving sin. Hear this. Whilst we cannot choose our anxieties, we can choose our responses. Whilst we cannot choose our anxieties, we can choose our responses. 
And so it is for good reason that Jesus spends the whole of the second part of Matthew chapter 6 addressing anxiety. Three times in these verses, he commands his people, do not be anxious. He repeatedly says, do not be anxious. I don't know about I don't know about you. All I can say again is for myself when I come to these passages and I see that repeated command from Jesus not to be anxious. I often look at my own life and think, what the blazes is going on? And that's just me being honest. Why am I so anxious when Jesus repeatedly tells me not to be anxious? He says, do not be anxious. The people in his day were worried, they were anxious, and they had genuine need. They had genuine reasons to worry. Most of them had legitimate needs. Remember when the 5,000 gathered to hear Jesus and it was time to eat? What was the need in front of them? They had no food. They had no food. And the disciples were sent out scarred the crowd, they come up with two loaves, or five loaves, two fish. These people had genuine need. And Jesus commands them not to worry. And what he said to them applies to us today as well. We, not, we may not be worrying about our food, where we will eat today, but there are many worries, many anxieties that creep into our life and they're just the same. As I say, most of us won't worry about where we'll eat today. The milestone inevitably will get a good hit after we leave here today. But what I want to do today is give us some reasons not to be anxious, as Jesus does. Jesus doesn't just say, don't be anxious, and then walk away. He says, don't be anxious, and then he gives us reasons not to be anxious. The opening words of this section are important. Jesus began saying, therefore I tell you. And we, we can't miss the context here of where we were last week. And so, so let me just go back a little bit, read the context of where we were last week, and then we'll see why Jesus says this. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other one, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore... That's the context. Really important. You cannot serve God and money, therefore. And when there's a therefore in the scriptures, you always have to ask what it's therefore. Well done. Some of you are awake. Actually, some of the youth leaders who were here away all weekend were more awake than you've been lying on your backsides at home all weekend. All right, I'm just saying. <coughs> you have to ask what the therefore is there for. And it's there because it's coming on the back of a context. Jesus has just spoken about money. And not serving two masters. It's impossible to do so. It's not as if he's taking up a completely new topic. He's not. Sometimes we, we, we look at the, the Bible here, and we've got it, I've got one in front of me, and we, we, we look at it here, and the subheadings are, Lay up treasures in heaven. Verse 19 to 24 and then we stop, and there's another subheading, do not be anxious, verse 25 to 34. That's not the way the text flows. The text flows all as one thought. And so what's the therefore, therefore? It comes on the back of the context about worrying ourselves about money. Reason one, not to worry. It distracts us from what is more important. It distracts us from what is more important. If the focus of your life is on worrying about all the things that you have to worry about, then your, the focus of your life cannot be on the kingdom of God. 
if the focus of your life is on all the things that you need to worry about and have to worry about, then your focus cannot be on the kingdom of God. Some of you may have read C.S. Lewis' uh, book, Screwtape Letters. It's a fictitious account of a senior demon who writes to his nephew, demon, giving, giving him advice on how to afflict, uh, afflict the human that the devil has put him in charge of in trying to get him to hell. In one chapter, the demon tells his nephew, there is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy. Our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. Make them anxious. There is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading the human's mind against the enemy. Obviously, the enemy being God here to this demon. Our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them, make them anxious. And of course, the reason Satan and his demons want us to keep worrying about what will happen to us is when we keep worrying about what will happen to us, our focus moves from the kingdom of God to what will happen to us. Simple. We cannot be focused on the kingdom and his work if we are constantly, perpetually worrying about what will happen to us here on earth. You can say, you can even feel, I think God is calling me here to some form of ministry. I think God is calling me to do some form of work for him. You can say that. And on the flip side of that, you can immediately go to, but I don't know how that's going to be provided for. I don't know how I'm going to get through. I don't know where this is going to come from. That, that's what the enemy will do. So you can either go ahead and obey God's call on your life to what he has called you to do, what ministry he has taken you up to do, or you can focus on how you're going to be provided for and be anxious over that. But here's the thing, you can't do both. You can't do both. You may think to yourself, God wants me to go on a mission trip, but I'm afraid I'll get an illness. So you don't go, or the plane will crash, or we get hijacked. You can be consumed by all the anxieties, or you can focus on the kingdom, but you can't do both. Because one will lead you to go, and one will lead you to stay. As a church, we can think to ourselves, do you know, it's going to be coming up very soon, just to warn you. Uh, we can think to ourselves, we should be, we, we, can, we can build something. We can, we, can, we can move into a building. We can do something. We can, we, can, we can focus on that. We can think on the direction that God is taking us and, and God is, wants us to go. Or we can focus on, we'll never get the money. The church can either focus on building the kingdom or it can worry about the economy. It can't do both. can't do both. So today, I'm going to challenge you as I challenge myself when it comes to worrying, where will your focus be? Where will your focus be? Are you going to determine to focus on the kingdom or are you going to determine to focus on your anxieties? Because one or the other is going to determine how you live for the kingdom. And again, I can only share from personal experience. When my anxiety overwhelms me, I freeze. I freeze. And I freeze in my effectiveness for the kingdom of God. Because I am letting the anxieties of this world cloud my vision of the kingdom.
that's the reason Jesus says later in the chapter, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Because Jesus knows, I know, especially you ladies think you're multitaskers. Uh, <coughs> the reality is, we can only focus on one thing. Truly, only focus on one thing. And so we're either going to focus on our anxieties or we're going to focus on the kingdom. Don't, Jesus is saying to us, don't waste your focus on the things that you cannot control. Focus on the kingdom. Focus on serving me. Focus on ministering to people. And what? I will take care of you. Focus on the kingdom. Focus on serving me. Focus on ministering to people. And I will take care of you. Our anxieties distract us. Second thing. And I know when I say this, every single person who is an anxious person in this room will agree with me. One, our anxiety distracts us from things that are more important. Two, our anxiety does no good. Anybody realize that? If you're an anxious person, you realize that? Your anxiety, my anxiety, does no good. None. Jesus says, and which of you by being anxious can add a single R to your life? There's a wee bit of a, I, I found this funny this week actually. There's a wee bit of debate among scholars on whether that expression means adding uh, length to your life or height. I'm going to take it that there's a possibility that I might get taller. Just going to take it like that. Don't think it's going to happen. But which of you by being anxious can add a single R to your life? The truth is, it doesn't matter what, it's fairly obvious what it means. It means that absolutely nothing, listen to this, absolutely nothing positive can come from our worrying. In fact, we know worrying will in fact, like medically, anxiety, worry, stress can do what? Shorten our lives, if anything. Can become the source of all kinds of health problems, but nothing good comes from our worry and our anxiety. Many of you will know that I have a, a bit of a notion of Man United Football Club, right? And many of you will know that our household uh, is, has a bit of a notion of Man United, right? Uh, I would love to put a camera up in our living room sometimes and let you see what we are like when a United game's on, right? I, I, uh, tell me, tell me said, I know because I've sought home group sometimes. Uh, but if it's on in a different room... Uh, but right, so, and you're maybe like this, right? When you're watching a football game, when you're watching the team that you love, when you are, what, they're, they're playing a game, and it doesn't matter who they're playing. They could be playing bottom of the league team, which probably will be more dangerous for us at the minute than it would be for anybody else. But they could be playing anybody in any competition and doing that, right? And I will be screaming at the TV. Screaming at the TV. One thing I do know, they can't hear me. Right? I do know that. They cannot hear me, but I will scream at the TV. Another thing I do know is I will sit up in the chair and I will be anxious. I, I'll sit and I'll stress and I'll get myself into almost a ball of like tension and stress and be anxious about what's going to happen. And we usually know the outcome these days, but anyway, it's like, what's going to happen? What are they going to do? How are they going to play this? What, are they, like, what difference does that make? You don't know. Genuinely, are some of you out there thinking that makes a difference? 
like some power transforms, like goes from me to I can hag and then I can hag. No, it makes no difference. None. Zero. Our anxiety and our stress and our worrying will make no difference. None. Just as my stressing over United makes no difference, neither does your worrying about a certain situation. It doesn't add a single thing to that issue. In fact, often it creates more problems than it takes away. It worries at your physical, your mental, your emotional health. And so Jesus, the person who loves you, most. It says, don't worry. You need to hear that. I need to hear that. The person that loves you most says, do not worry. Do not be anxious. Jesus gives several reasons in this chapter why we shouldn't worry. But most of them boil down to the one big reason. If you're note taken this morning, first reason, it distracts anxiety, worry, distracts. Two, it does no good. And the third thing, the third reason why we shouldn't worry this morning, and this is the big one, is this. He says it over and over again in this chapter you have a heavenly father you have a heavenly father Jesus says the best reason not to worry is that you have a father who will take care of you Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? You have a heavenly Father who will take care of you. Jesus introduces us what is, to what is really the central thought of this chapter. I don't know if you've noticed it over the past few weeks, but again and again, Jesus' words have centered around the Father. Chapter 5, verse 45, or verse 45 he tells us to love our enemies so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. 548, there you, ha you, you be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Chapter 6, verse 1, do not be like the hypocrites, or you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Chapter 6, verse 4, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 6-6, six, six, pray in your closet that your Father will reward you, that your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 6-8, your Father who knows what you need before you ask Him. 6-9, pray then in this way, our Father who art in heaven. 6-14, if you forgive others, your heavenly Father will forgive you. 6-15, if you do not forgive, then your Father will not forgive your, tres your trespasses. 6-18, do do, don't fast to be seen by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And in your, your father who sees what, in sec what happens in secret will reward you. 626, the birds of the air and your heavenly father feeds them. 632, your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Do you think Jesus is trying to make a point that we have a heavenly father who loves us and cares for us and who wants to look after us? In seven, 
7 to 11, Ask and it will be given to you. For what man is there among you who when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone or ask for a fish will give him a snake? Then you being evil know how to give your good, uh, good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven provide for you and give you what you ask for? Over and over and over again in the Sermon of the Mount, at least 14 times, Jesus refers to God in heaven as our Father. As our Father. Some of you maybe for the first time need to realize that this morning. I know maybe you've been in church for years, but you, and, and you know God, and, you, th and you, you think you know His character, and you think he's, he's the man in the sky, the big man in the sky who's angry and who is... All the things that you, you think you know about him. But some of you for the first time this morning need to realize that he is your heavenly father. Who is a perfect father and who loves you and is, is, will care for you. This especially comes to the forefront here in the second part of Matthew 6. As Jesus talks about worry and anxiety, he says, don't worry about all these things because your father knows you and will take care of you. He knows what you need before you ask him. Verse, verse 8. You're worth much more than any other being on the planet. Verse 26. He knows that you need all the things that you need verse 32. He says, if we know, I, I, I quoted it there from chapter 7, if we know how to take care of our own children, being sinful human beings, how much more does our heavenly Father know how to take care of us? Surely there is just one lesson we need to take away from the second part of Matthew 6. You have a heavenly father. I have a heavenly father who loves us, who cares for us, and who will provide for us. And you don't need to worry about it. Your father will take care of you. I am a sinful human being. I know that would may come as a shock to many of you. But that was a joke, by the way. You're supposed to laugh. Uh, I am a sinful human being. And I would do anything for my children. Anything. I kill for them, as some of you well know. The first boyfriend that Anna Irvine brings home, I'm just saying. I've told her it's not going to happen, so she just may get on with it. But uh, that may be a cause for church discipline on my end at some stage. But I would do anything for them. Anything. But don't we see, Jesus is telling us here that the way that I feel about my children is nothing compared to the way that he feels about you. It peels into insignificance just how much God loves you and wants to provide for you. Hudson Taylor, famous missionary, went to China in the 1800s. Some of his friends, his well-meaning friends, how is it that we, we all seem to have well-meaning friends? Job had them. Every missionary that ever seemed to go out seemed to have them. Some of his well-meaning friends were concerned that during his absence, the people in England were giving to, that the people in England who were giving to his mission 
would forget him because he wasn't around. And Taylor said to them, I am taking my children with me. And I notice it is not difficult to remember that they need breakfast in the morning, dinner at midday, and supper at night. Indeed, I could not forget them if I tried. And I find it impossible to think that my heavenly Father is less tender and mindful to his children than I, a poor earthly father, am of mine. No, he will not forget us. You have a father who loves you. One, do not be anxious because it distracts from more important things as in the kingdom of God. Two, do not be anxious because your anxiety and your worry and your stress do no good. Three, do not worry. Do not be anxious because you have a perfect heavenly father who wants to care for you, provide for you, comfort you, give you everything you need here on this earth. But I need to say this as I close. This certainty and this peace is only for those who know God as their heavenly Father. Now some might say, is God not Father to everyone? And in a sense, He is as in he created us all. But we know the problem. We know the issue. In our sin, we all walked away from our Heavenly Father. Every one of us walked away. Just like in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, the son walks away from the Father relinquishing all the benefits of being a son. Did it change the father's position? No, the father was always there, continually waiting for the son to return. But this picture is a picture with what each one of us have done with our father. We walked away from him. And the Bible says that that sin has caused separation between us and our Father. And as I say, just in, in, like the, the Father in the story of the prodigal son, God still loves us. God still wants us to return. That's why He sent Christ for us. But if you're in here this morning and you have not returned, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord, you have no confidence in God as your Father. None. And so maybe the first step you need to take in eliminating this anxiety, this stress for your, from your life is actually accepting Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, coming to Him, and then you will know God as your Father, and you can look at these verses, and you can see that He will provide for me. And once you've done that, and trust yourself to Christ, then you can call God your Heavenly Father. I want to finish from Philippians 4. It says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard 
your hearts and minds in Christ. You see the promise there in that text? Be anxious for nothing, but in all things through prayer and thanksgiving, come to your Father. Come to your Father. And what? The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Come to your Father. Come to your Father. Come to your Father. And that peace will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. These are not easy things to deal with. Inevitably, you will walk through those doors today. And tomorrow, something will come along. Or maybe not even tomorrow. This afternoon, something will come along. That will make you anxious. It is not that that is the sin. But it is the response to that. Which may be or may not be. Come to your father. Come to your father. Who loves you. And cares for you. And wants to provide for you. In every situation. Let me pray. Father, we are so aware of our own sinful hearts. So many reasons why we're anxious and stressed. And so many reasons why we're worried. And yet, you've clearly told us, don't do it. Come to me. Father, as we remind ourselves tomorrow, now very, very soon, of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Help us to remember that that sacrifice was made in order that we might know peace. Thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.